You are listening to Design Systems Beyond the Button, where we dive into everything related to design systems for everyone from newbies to seasoned practitioners. I'm Neff, Products Marketing Manager at Zero Height, and I'm excited to use this podcast to get my burning design system questions answered. I'm joined by my colleague, Michelle Chin, a design advocate who has seen and experienced so much around design systems. So, so much. Um <laughs> Uh, it never never ceases to amaze me that I can still learn so much more and experience so much more. So I'm really looking forward to sharing the tips, tricks, and experiences on what I've done, but also from what I've seen with other design system teams. I think there's not much being publicly said about design systems and the work that kind of goes on behind the scenes because it can be very personal to a company. And this is a great way to shed insight on design system topics and challenges people may have so you can create your bestest design system ever. Totally. And I'm really excited about today's topic because I finally get to talk a little bit about marketing, which I know infinitely more about than design systems, which is to say that I know two things. But today's question or our topic is how much should brand and marketing be involved in your design system? This feels like an age old question, like how often in your experience are people wondering, should we share a design system? Do we even have the same goals? Is this something that comes up a lot for you, Michelle? Um, It's interesting. I I don't it doesn't come up a lot, but I think that's part of the problem. Right. It's just like Mm. people don't people working in product on design systems um, for their products aren't always thinking about brand and marketing. because they are very separate entities um, in terms of business structure. I think, you know, when we're making a design system, we're thinking about, okay, what are our company's color palettes? What are the logos? Some basic things. But other than that, like, it's more of like a one way, okay, let me grab the information and use it, um, but not yeah. really thinking more beyond that. But I think that's kind of the, the challenge that needs to, to fix uh, or the mentality that needs to shift. Yeah, totally. That makes a lot of sense. And I suppose before we get too far into today's episode, we should probably say that we're going to use brand and marketing interchangeably, even though at your company, you might have a brand team that is separate from the traditional marketing team. Um, So keep that in mind and feel free to use them interchangeably as well as you ask questions in the chat. Um, But I suppose let's also sort of establish a baseline, right? So part of this is around how much marketing marketing should should have an an impact impact on the design design system, system. but we also should separate product design from comms or marketing design. How are those two types of designers and those two goals different in your opinion? Yeah, I think it's um, primarily like it's there's a good overlap, but also like a pretty separate space for both of them. And Mm -hmm. I think it's more based on sometimes it's even the users are different. Uh, So you're marketing the people wanting to buy and learn more about your product could be the end users of the product, but they could also be an IT admin or someone else like a, you know, a manager and they're not going to use the tool directly, but the employees that they manage or even the employees at the company, especially if it's like an enterprise app, um, the IT person might be looking at the marketing site, but the the day to day user is not looking at the marketing site. They're like more in the product. Um, so I think it's just, it, the situation depends on kind of like what the goal is, like what has brought the the visitor to the website or the, the user to the product, you know, what are they trying to do? Um, but yeah, so it could be the same people, could be different people. Um, but I think overall, yeah, like that's, that's kind of the distinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I suppose audience and goal um, are going to separate those two different types of design and those two designers. So I suppose let's sort of start with the positives. In terms of the benefits of aligning product and marketing. And I suppose I'm making an assumption here because if we did invite brand and marketing into our design system, the reason that we would do that is to make sure that our marketing materials like the website, ad campaigns, et cetera, look and feel similar to what is happening in the actual product interface. So if those two things get closer, is there a benefit to both of those users assuming that they might be different people? 
Yeah, for sure. I, I think the big thing is that it establishes like the brand. So products are really uh, like a marketing mechanism for for the company. If you think about it, when you go to use um, like a, like an Uber app or a Lyft app, it's like that app is kind of resonating the brand of, of Uber and Lyft. Um, so even though it is like a, a utility product, it is still part of, of the brand. Um, so when you align to the same, you know, brand logo and color and format, like that builds that consistency of the brand, but also it helps build that trust. So when mm -hmm. products look similar across the board um, and products match the marketing website to a certain extent, like it shows that like your, your organization has their stuff together, right? You can trust this product um, because when things are inconsistent, people are like, I don't know, maybe did something not load? Is something broken? Do they know? what they're doing, is this coded properly, is this secure, right? So you wanna have all that matchy match um, for sure. Yeah, it is a crazy jarring experience. Like if you're on a website and everything's purple and green and then suddenly you're on the product and it's completely black and white, um, it sort of feels a little bit like, did I land in the wrong place? Am I, am I even supposed to be here? Um, so I think that idea of consistency, which is something that we talk about a lot in product design, um, certainly rears its head in terms of how we create this cohesive experience from marketing to product. And I, I think I think for me, a lot of times when I think about websites specifically, but really lots of marketing, it is the front door to your product. So people perhaps have engaged with that multiple times before they actually engage with the product itself. Um, so they might even be more intimately familiar with the color palette and the typography um, and the content sort of guidelines that are fueling into marketing design than they are with product design. Uh, I, what do you think about that? Do you think that's, that's true? Yeah, I, I think that's that's certainly a really good aspect of like, yeah, the front door is like the marketing aspect. And so they have that first time experience um, and they expect to have some of the same level of that experience when they get to product. So if there is a big disconnect, it might have the perception that something's amiss, something's not not quite right. Um, so I think it's, it's like when you're carrying things over, it's really, really great. I think there is a distinction of like how much of like mm -hmm. the marketing aspect you do carry over into the product because it's not, you're not always like the marketing site is really trying to inform users, um, promote the product to hopefully get you to buy it. Um, but once you're in the product, you don't really need that same style of messaging. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that is the perfect segue to sort of when product and marketing ought to diverge. And I think the big thing for me as a marketer is I want a lot of room for innovation, right? Like I think a lot of marketing is trying things on for size and kind of deciding if it sticks. So maybe this is going to completely uh, sort of offend all of the true product designers in the room, but like you might play around with like button sizes and see if that allows more people to request a demo. Uh, maybe the contrast is going to be a little bit different on a marketing site or a marketing ad than it is in product. So I suppose as a marketer, I want to be able to diverge from product design in ways that are going to allow me to really achieve my goal that, to your point earlier, is different from what product designers need to take a look at. And I would imagine that the same is probably true for product designers. They maybe don't want some of the flashy things that might work in marketing in the product because they might actually take away from some of what you're you want users to accomplish there yeah yeah totally that that's a great point I think the other thing is like you know oftentimes marketing teams might have their own separate design system specifically for the mm. marketing website and in that case like because the use cases like like you said you want to have bigger buttons to call attention to things um, but if your product is more of like a IT admin dashboard thing, a lot of those users want a compressed site or compressed app with a lot of dense information. Sure. So they're not going to want those giant buttons. They're going to want really tiny buttons. So I think that's the thing is like, it's definitely okay to have different design systems. 
Um, you know, and then it's up to the designer, the design product design team, as well as the marketing team to kind of figure out like, what's that balance that you have in terms of like shared elements. So maybe it's just a color palette, but even then it might not even be the color palette as well. Um, I think, you know, when I worked on a design system, the, the marketing team created a color palette of these like series of greens and it turned out like the green that we wanted to use wasn't accessible so there wasn't enough color contrast when used with um like white button labels and so we worked with them to adjust the color contrast and we got to a green that was like very very similar to what they originally had except it passed um accessibility color contrast tests. So there is some flexibility, but I, I think the, the other thing is like, no one was going to know that it was a different green because it was so, so similar. Sure. Um, but I think that's the thing is like, it's, it's good to have those conversations to be able to align. Um, they didn't change their green because they were using it for different purposes in the color palette, but like, it was nice that we had a specific green that we could use that would work and and have that flexibility because we we are addressing different audiences we might have different standards and different use cases for things um, sure. so yeah it's it's definitely like a good a good way to like find a a happy medium and build a, a bridge between those two spaces totally in in a situation where marketing has their own design system and product has a design system. Should those design systems live in the same place? Should people be looking at both or do we think of them as completely separate um, and having completely separate internal audiences as well? Yeah, I, I think for the most part, it's like, depending that typically like enterprise companies, very, very separate at smaller companies, maybe your uh, design and engineering team also manage the marketing website. So where those style guides and, and design system documentation uh, live can really vary. So it can be in separate sites um, linked to each other so they people know how to get to both. Um, or it can be very, very separate where um, like a like a product team doesn't know exactly where to find the brand guidelines or something. Um, and, and that's because it's, it can get confusing. I think, uh, I remember one time at my last company, which was an enterprise company, the marketing team released a new brand design, which included a design system site. And then somehow, I guess there was an email sent out about it, but all these engineers found it and they're like, should we be using these buttons? And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, no, no. Like. <laughs> that's for the marketing site like it's not for for our actual product and and I think that's the other thing is like it really needs to be clear like when when you provide style guides if you know that there's multiple teams out there that you provide very clear guidelines you know somewhere at the top saying this is specifically for the marketing website this is not for product design if you're looking for product design you go here because I think the other thing is like it, it helps direct people in the right place before they start assuming that they can start using a design system site, um, like with like the like components and definitions that that aren't applicable to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You want to make sure that some rogue email doesn't lead to tons of rogue things in the product. One thing that I'll throw out is I think when we talk about adopting design systems reusability comes up over and over again and that often is the inroads that uh, lead to saving time and making product teams more efficient so if there are instances in which a marketing team is using a button that is very similar to what might exist in the product should we be looking for reusability there or does it feel like it becomes too squishy to try to share components and things of that nature across the aisle? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I, I almost think it might depend on the scale of your team. So hmm. if you have, um, if you're a smaller company where the designers and developers are working on both the product and the marketing website, maybe it makes sense to have some crossover, but maybe thinking more strategically around you know, what is the the strategy behind marketing? What's the strategy behind product? What is the visual direction and the, mm -hmm. the user experience trying to go? Um, do we expect to see um, some 
expansion and growth of like the teams and and what we do. So maybe, you know, having those shared elements might not be great in terms of like future proofing and long term stuff. Um, but I think yeah, at bigger companies, they're very separate. So it's likely to have things very separate. I think it's it's helpful to share, right? Like I, it's not mm -hmm. to say that these these teams should be siloed, but it's just more like keep the work separate to be able to manage it better to, to afford those innovations and in, from either side, um, but also maintain good communication to make sure um, there's collaboration happening. Because oftentimes marketing teams, especially big ones, have UX designers who aren't working on product, but they are, their product is the website. So um, totally. it's always great to like have, a broader group to share, get feedback from, um, to learn about things. So, so definitely collaborate, even though like you might have to keep your work separate. For sure. For sure. I know internally we have talked a lot about themable design systems. And I think in the broader design system community, there has been a lot of talk about design systems as well. I think it's Brad Faros who is like, maybe we just have like one global design system and we all sort of like theme components based off of it. So I suppose if there is the possibility of a world that looks like that, do you think there also could be the possibility that, I don't know, three, four years from now, we might be able to have design systems from product design and marketing design sort of like co less with very different themes or does that still feel too close to you i i think it you know i think it's definitely possible from like an implementation perspective um because it does make things more efficient right if you the idea with brad frost the global design system is that you have like not every company and every team needs to redesign a button right like we all mm -hmm. kind of have an idea of like what a button looks like and then you can choose to have like you know, squared off corners or rounded corners. Uh, you can choose to have an icon on the left or right. You can choose what font, the colors. Um, so if you set up like a bare bones, like coded component element, and then you can layer on a theme of like, you know, whatever your brand's font is, whatever you want, rounded corners, squared off corners, however, um, you can easily do that. So I think from a, a structural, like logistical aspect, you could do that. But I think what gets kind of like where things get complicated is that it might confuse people as to like which mm. component they're supposed to use or which theme they're supposed to use or what can they and can't they like I yeah I think and maybe maybe that's the thing is like even with a theme maybe it's like the product design team's theme for this product and then the marketing sure product, maybe it is is okay um, but also again like usage guidelines might differ as well so. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of documentation, maybe that still remains separate, even though like the the core essence of the the elements are are shared and just you know with a theme applied. It would be interesting. Like we'll have to like come back in four years and see where we landed. All right, uh, we'll make a date. I'll send you a calendar invite. Twenty twenty eight, right back here. here. Um, I think, I think up until, until this point, we've been, been talking about the visual elements that make up design, but there also is this entire discipline around content design and ensuring that we are clear in the way that we talk to users and consistent. Um, and I suppose, is there more of an overlap between content designers on a product team and perhaps, perhaps your, your content, content marketer? marketer? Should, Should there, there be, be the same tone of voice that folks are speaking in? Ought we follow the same guidelines? Or do, or do those, those also feel like two, two very separate audiences that ought not converge either? either? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think there are like basics that kind of overlap and can be shared. So for example, the overall voice and tone, if your company sounds, you know, more casual or more professional, mm -hmm. um, sharing some of those elements. But I think also like, you know, from a user UX designer's perspective, when you're writing copy, it's usually to inform um, and to help like people get through their workflow. So you're really just informing but with from a marketing aspect you are informing to a certain extent but you're also um i think using more um more creative and interesting language right to get people excited For about sure. the product and get informed and understand the value so those are very different purposes if you think about it 
Um, so if you're writing like an error message in a product, you wouldn't want some, I don't know, fun, excited, engaging message. You just kind of want to be like, this is your error. This is bad. Right. Um, so I think, I think from that aspect, those are very different, but overall, like you can have like the, a similar voice and tone that kind of carries through. Um, and, and I think the other thing is like, sometimes there are like, I don't know, scenarios where you want some more marketing type of messages. Mm -hmm. So, um, like if you add a new feature to the product and you want people to know about it, you might have like a, like a modal that displays that says, Hey, we have this new, you know, AI feature, um, rather than having totally. a very straightforward, like boring text about it. Cause you want people to use the new feature. Um, you can, you know, have some more like marketing style copy added. And I think, you know, that's also a great collaboration point between marketing and product where you can figure out like what, how to position the feature. Cause you're not, you're like promoting the feature. You're not really selling the product. So it's a little different and, but you're also in the product. So you want to make sure you have like a, a consistent, you're not veering from your, your traditional voice and tone from the product. So I remember like, I think that's the thing is like, I, when I was doing product design, we had new feature, like I felt like I had to write the copy and then I'm like, well, this is hard. Like, and, and I realized I was like, oh my gosh, I can talk to the marketing team and ask them to like help. So I think that's the thing is like, don't be afraid to ask marketing for guidance. Like, you know, I think a lot mm -hmm. of times UX designers might struggle with, with writing copy um, unless you really love to write. And so it can be hard to even write like, like basic copy, but also like marketing copy. So um, it was great. Like I remember uh, this coworker and I collaborated on, on the copy and we had to strike a balance because the perspective she was coming from was more of like a, like a, I don't know, like a buy this feature aspect, which, which wasn't what we were trying to go for. So it was kind of like finding mm -hmm. a way to meet in the middle, which I think also helped us create like some basic guidelines on how to onboard and introduce new features within the product, which was really cool. Yeah, for sure. I, I had a lot of thoughts as you were talking there. Um, the, the first, first one, one that I'll throw at you is, do you think content design and marketing design is more similar in B2C companies than in B2B companies? I think like for me, maybe like Duolingo is like top of mind because I just got a message from them that says that Duo is sad because I haven't been doing my Spanish lessons. But there is certainly a difference between some of the marketing messages that you might have, but their product is also quite playful and seems to fall into that same place. So I, I guess I'm curious, as B2B folks, it's very easy to be like, okay, well, the website can be playful, but once people get into the product, they're trying to do their jobs. So we want to be exceptionally clear about our messaging, and we want to make sure that we're not joking around too much. But when we're talking to individuals, um, especially in a place where it's supposed to be like a fun app, or like things of that nature, might we want those teams to be a little bit closer together? Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, I was definitely speaking from a, a B2B perspective, but like for a B2C, like I think, yeah, like that's part of like your brand, your vibe and experience. So the closer that can be, like the the better that is to carry that, that through um, for sure. Yeah. And, and I think that's the thing is like, you know, depending on your app, like maybe you need mm -hmm. to be more informal, right? Like I think Duolingo does a really great job of being more informal and, and catching that more casual aspect and, and having that throughout all of their, their marketing materials as well as their product. Yeah. So I think it really, I think the, it, you know, it's, it's thinking about who your audience is and establishing like what, what's the crossover and overlap between brand and product and maybe they're you know in some circumstances it's very close and others it's mm -hmm. it's further apart but like understanding that um and knowing how you will engage with the different teams is also really good i think that's the thing is like setting those expectations is is really key to like the success of everything yeah 
Yeah. And, and I guess the other scenario that I'll throw at you is product led growth, which I feel like has been a catchphrase, at least for the last two or three years. You can't turn your head in either direction without hearing it. And I think in some companies, what that means is that product managers and the overall product team, including designers, now have a stake in whether or not users upgrade if they do buy additional features, assuming that they are sold separately. So I think think in some regards, we can think of product managers um, and the product team as sort of having this goal of having users use the product, right? And then when we think about some PLG models, there is that additional layer of having users buy the product or purchase a new plan or something of that nature. So I guess in that regard, when it changes the goal a bit in terms of what we want people to do, is that the time where you might raise your hand and say, hey, marketing, help me out to figure out how I can get users to make an in-app purchase or something of that nature? And if so, do we then create create guidelines that exist within the product that are a fundamentally different purpose, right? Like it is really about like revenue creation there um, versus what we might think of as more like traditional product development. Yeah, yeah, that is a really great point. And I think that's the thing is like, um, now looking back on like that example of like showcasing a new feature, like the product manager was very invested in having uh, users adopt the new feature, right? So, and also mm -hmm. like looking for other opportunities for them to further invest in the product. So um, we did work with product managers on the wording, the features, like the planning, how to, how to inform users. So it's very much like a collaborative effort. Um, and I think that's the thing is like when you're, when you're focused on that, like I think just involving all the right people who, who can benefit from from the effort um who need to benefit from the effort so i think that's like the the big thing is is you know it can't hurt to like ask hey you know do you want to be involved should you be involved sometimes like you don't know like i i didn't originally think marketing should be involved in like you know talking about this new uh feature we had but then i was like wait this is a marketing thing like we want to you know get them to to use this and so um i just you know means reaching out to somebody and saying, hey, you know, is, is this something you can participate in? More often than not, they they are happy to participate. Um, and I think mm -hmm. it's also, it's one of those things that like evolves over time. So maybe it's more of a grassroots effort, like you reach out to someone from marketing um, and they see like the value that everyone is providing by collaborating, that it becomes more part of a, a typical process with your, your products as well. And I think that just, it, it builds relationships, which is really helpful because then, you know, when the marketing team is trying to showcase like the product or like other features, they're not just working with um, PMs or working with designers to get information like, okay, like, you know, what, what kind of screenshots would be beneficial and sharing that type of thing. Yeah. You have worked at some pretty massive companies, um, and thus far, I've only worked at startups. So I'm wondering, for folks who also work at really large enterprise companies, do you have any tips on how you find out who the right person is, right? Like, you might be a product designer and have no idea who in marketing you might need to contact to get some help on an in-app message or something else. How did you go about sort of navigating that and making sure that you were talking to the right person who would be best positioned to help? Yeah, that's a really great question because I guess enterprise companies of like several thousand people are very, very big and it's very easy to be siloed from, from those teams, especially if they're globally distributed, if you're not going to the mm -hmm. office, you don't physically see them. Um, I think it can start with asking your PM. So asking your product manager, hey, who who helps us with our marketing? They probably have... Um, an insight to someone from marketing, they, you know, bigger companies usually have product marketing managers who are very tied in with um, the PMs and can be a good connection. Um, I think the other thing is like asking, you know, other managers, especially if you're new to a design team, other managers and other leadership within your design team, like, hey, who do we work with when it comes to marketing? Um, sometimes depending like your user research team might be in touch with marketing because they mm. often have to, sometimes they have to ask like, can we, 
uh, use a marketing mailing list to reach out for uh, per participants in a usability study, that type of thing. So I think, yeah, just kind of like asking around, those are like good starting points. Carlos mentions um, like seeking people who've been there for a number of years, which I think is really, really helpful because they can also provide some context. They can be like, oh, yeah, here's who you want for marketing, but also this team is fairly new, like because of X, Y, Z reason, like we got bought out and whatever. Like, so I think that's also super helpful to have that context because, um, you know, if if you didn't have that context, you can go there and be like, oh, this this marketing marketing team doesn't know anything, but it's because they, they came in, right? Like it wasn't because they, they had been established. So um, for sure. That, that is, is really, really, really good, good advice. advice. And, and honestly, honestly, even if you work in a startup, startup seeking out people who have been there for a while, while might, might give you some institutional knowledge in terms of how to navigate. Catherine also had a really good question over in the chat. Um, they said, if you deal with multiple brands and do cross promotion, how do you manage the design system in terms of tokens, architecture, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so I guess, are you asking about, um, I guess like, you know, I'm curious to know what you mean by like doing cross promotion. Is that like informing people of of multiple brands? Yeah, the way, yeah, that, the way I that I interpret it, it and we'll see, and we'll if, see Catherine if Catherine gives, gives us some insight. insight. Um, so it sounds, um, so it sounds, like, sounds exactly like exactly that. that. Yeah, 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 like, like uh, uh, different, different brands all talked, talked about at the same time. How do you manage that and ensure that it's not messy? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question because I think that's that's the thing is like people can see things all over the place and even if they look similar they'll be like oh my gosh like this like we're not using design tokens but like this other product has design tokens okay so Catherine said mm -hmm. so say the button is green for this brand but the site uses blue buttons um and that, i think that's a very common thing so it's really helping educate the the company and the organization so um and i think the biggest thing is like get used to repeating yourself pretty frequently. Um, that's the tip that I learned when I was going to be a manager. They're like, get used to repeating yourself over and over again. Um, and 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 that's just because people just need to hear it several times and in different formats. So I think the big thing is, you know, if you have like a roadshow or a kickoff, very explicitly saying like what these multiple brands are and where their design system lives, and who is supposed to use, like what products are using which system, being very clear about that. Um, and it's not to say like, you know, you're trying to say never go to this other design system. Cause I think the other thing is like, people, you know, will look at other design systems, but they'll also, they might find something that's actually cool and that they can use. So like if mm -hmm. one brand is using design tokens and another isn't, they might check out to see how the other team is doing design tokens and see if they can implement it. So I think, you know, having roadshows that announce that having resources that very explicitly show the the differences and how products align to the different brands um but also on your design system documentation like very explicitly saying this is for the following products um if you are looking for x y and z other products go here right so providing those resources to put them in the right direction um and then i think that's really helpful because that way in case they navigate to that by accident, there they have there is some sort of signal that it isn't the the correct site. Um, and even if they were to use it, and if one of their other peers, like another developer, is like, "Hey, this isn't the thing we're supposed to use," um, they can even show them, "Hey, like, see this banner says that it's only for these other products, not the product we work on." Um, so it's kind of putting this in multiple places. Like, it might feel a little annoying, but it would be <laughs> it's super valuable. Um, but I think it's also worth mentioning, like, you know, hey, knock yourself out, explore these systems, learn some things, talk, talk with each other, right? Because um, it, it can create like a lot of good collaboration and elevate everyone's products. Totally. And, and I suppose the other part of Catherine's question, and I'm not sure if this is exactly how you meant it, so please let me know in the chat, Catherine. But 
that piece around cross promotion, I almost imagine that being, I am in product A, uh, sort of having a workaround. And perhaps there's like an in-app message that comes up and is like, hey, if you love this particular feature in product A, man, are you going to be excited about product B uh, with the hopes that users are then going in and uh, increasing their usage of like the overall company um, or something of that nature. And I suppose I wonder how might you handle that when those different brands diverge? Does that in that message look like product B, the one that we want you to go and try? Does it look like product A, the one that you're currently in? Is it like some sort of weird Frankenstein of both of them? Um, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now I, I understand that part. And that's a really great question. Um, so I think, you know, it's think about the product that you're in and kind of maintain mm -hmm. that consistency. So like whatever you're, so you wouldn't, you know, necessarily start, if you're promoting another product, you wouldn't start using those elements. You might reference like screenshots or designs to show that it's a different, but like people want to know that they are still part of, of that product of the original product that, that you were, that they were in. Um, I think that it kind of is similar to when people figure out if they're going to design a mobile app, and they, they, you know, should they use native iOS conventions and native Android conventions, or should they use whatever is custom to their website? And so it's kind of striking that balance of like, a lot of times people go, okay, let's, let's kind of focus on the um, native aspects because people are familiar with that versus creating our own. Um, so it's kind of, you know, understanding like what situation you're in, the product you're in, and making sure people understand that they're still in the product without it all of a sudden feeling like something else has taken over. Um, I think the other thing is like people's imaginations run wild and they're like, why is this different? Right. And they, <laughs> especially like, I don't know, uh, it could seem like, uh, am I, you know, like, have I been, I don't know, has some malware launched? Am I being, you know, like what is going on? Right. So, so I think that's the thing is like, think of maybe the extremes, but try to like inst instill confidence. Yeah, totally. And and Catherine also pointed out in the chat that in their company specifically, they have two different brands that are within the same platform. So I would imagine that that also creates uh, a lot of thought amongst product designers about creating a very intentional bright line so that users know that I've switched over from product A to product B, even though I'm within the same ecosystem. Um, and and that that has to be tough. Have have you ever had to do that, Michelle, of like having two products, two products that, that exist within, within the same, same platform? platform? Um, I sort, yeah, sort of. And I think it, it's not an okay. easy thing to define because it's like, so we had a, like a, like a workflow builder. So you would have like your uh, managers create the workflow um, and then you would have your employees use the workflow, but sometimes managers are also the employees that use the workflow. So mm -hmm. trying to distinguish, you know, am I in the manager aspect of, of the website or am I in the end user product, right? So I think variations that we, we did was like, we switched some button styles, we switched like the UI. So we might, so maybe you have a, like a, like a solid blue banner at the top for the end user product, but like you have a white banner at the top for the uh, like manager interface. So you knew you were where you were in relation to the product. So it is, it is tricky. And, and that is really a good point to like consider, right? Like how do you, how do you navigate that? And I think, you know, a lot of that's like situational, right? Like think of the situation, even though your users are the same, think of the situation they're in. So, you know, are they, looking to research the product. So, you know, from a marketing perspective, are they using the product? Are they administering the product? Like what, what is their use case? So it, it goes beyond, you know, who are your users, right? Cause they're all the same, but they have different purposes. Yeah, totally, totally. And, and there's a good point here um, in the chat by Carlos. Um, when I said, in my experience, when non-design teams manage brand guidelines, your guidelines will be missing a lot of the needs that your digital platforms will have. And the way that I think about it, and curious if this is also true for you, Michelle, is that brand guidelines 
are managed by the brand team um, and they define some things like colors and topography and those sort of things. But then I think that there almost is like this separate set of guidelines that launches from those brand guidelines and might diverge in some ways, but is also like way, way, way more extensive than what might exist in the brand guidelines. And it is those sort of like usage guidelines and documentation that is meant to serve the product designers and the folks working on digital platforms. Does that seem right from the way that you've experienced things? Yeah, like so the the brand guidelines and it depends. Sometimes the brand guidelines, if it's with the marketing team, can also uh, like define some more of the smaller actual components used on marketing websites. Totally, totally. But, you know, the foundational aspects of color palette and like logo and typography and spacing and what have you, like some of that, you know, it's it's for product designers to use that to apply it to the product. I think the big thing is like it isn't the gospel. It's just inspirational. Right. Like definitely try to use as much as you can. But there are going to be times because brand people aren't always thinking of like a lot of the technical implementation aspects of product and UX. So. Um, for example, they, you know, brand focused on, they were like, they were, they were thinking about like web, but also um, print. And so they come up with these color palettes that weren't accessible for our actual product in the way we needed it. So we worked with them to say, hey, is it cool if we veer and make this green a little bit darker for color contrast? It's very similar. And they mm -hmm. were very cool with it. So like using that stuff as inspiration, um, but also, you know, helping them understand, because I think that's the thing is like, Brand people have a subject matter expertise in design when it comes to brand, but they might not have the expertise mm -hmm. when it comes to product design. But that's where product designers have that expertise, that subject matter knowledge of, I know good UX best practices, and we need things a certain way to ensure that we can provide those good experiences for users. Um, so I think that's the thing is like, if that means architecting your tokens on your own for your whatever reasons mm -hmm. for like especially with scalability and future proofing um and adoption from different teams like it might be something that you manage um and then it's separate right so i think that kind of came up in the chat of like how are design tokens managed i think it's very much of like helping people understand your your use case and the reason why you know it ought to be managed with the product team versus with a brand team um, and it's not to say that like people can't talk to each other, right? It's very much, you know, let's all have a conversation and see mm -hmm. how we can align, but also make meet both of our goals. So yeah, totally. I, I think if I were to sum up, I think where we have landed is it seems like product designers might look at style guides created by the brand or marketing team and attempt to take as much of that as possible um, with the consideration that they might be thinking about a different audience, it is a different context, and so on and so forth. Um, and there are going to be necessary times when they diverge. And perhaps it is the same in the opposite direction. Murphy might look at the way that the product has been assembled and say, hey, what can we take out of this to create as consistent an experience as possible? possible um, and where do we need to have fundamental differences and I think maybe if we have these folks sort of in conversation with each other then we arrive at something that users feel like is similar enough that they can trust it um, that they understand how to navigate it um, but it's different enough that it solves all of the needs of the different people internally yeah exactly I, I think that's the thing is like you know it's a great opportunity for collaboration. I think people shouldn't feel that brand is dictating, you know, one way or product is, you know, rebelling or dictating another way, right? Mm -hmm. It's very much like understanding each other's worlds and kind of coming to uh, a good consensus of, of how to move forward for the sake of the product and for the users that that are, are using the product because um, they want to feel that things are consistent, that they can trust it, that things are secure, um, and, and that they, you know, find value in, in the consistency of the product. 
Yeah, yeah. So we started the episode sort of with this question around how much should brand and marketing be involved in your design system? And it seems like we have arrived at the answer that we arrive at every single episode, which is it depends. Um, and I suppose you have to think about your particular uh, circumstances and everything that is going on. Uh, but certainly a question that I think is worth asking internally and worth having some discussions about. Would you say so? Yeah, for sure. Like, so the answer is definitely like, yes, everyone should be involved to some extent, but like to what extent? I think that's where you can also figure out um, what level that is. Um, sometimes brand, they don't want to be that involved. They trust you all, right? Mm -hmm. So coming to them, you know, when as needed, or maybe you are more involved when working with them if they are doing a brand refresh and a redesign because that has a lot of implications as well. So I think definitely keeping an open door and building those bridges is is super helpful and and a key to like really good success with your design system that to ensure that it looks like you know the brand that that was set forth um but yeah I, I think it's and it's also kind of fun right like it's i like learning about like the marketing aspect of things of like what's important um and kind of like what they're going for and it was great to like kind of have a like a platform to share, you know, hey, from a user perspective, like this is what we're thinking about and why. Um, so mm -hmm. it's it's just good all around. Um, maybe after this, everyone go seek out their favorite brand and marketing person. And, or if you don't know them, just like reach out and say hello. All right. If, if I don't, don't need a Slack, Slack message from you, Michelle, I'm going to be very offended because it means that you <laughs> like other people more than me, which honestly is fair. We have a really good yeah. team, so yeah. I might like some of them more than me too. No, no way. I wouldn't do this podcast if I didn't like you. So. No, no, no. Um, I'm not saying you don't like me. I'm just saying that there are other great people on our team, which is a good problem to have. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for joining. It sounds like you have a homework assignment to figure out times where you might be able to bring in uh, some marketing folks to join in on your design system work um, and to sort of start to create that bridge between the two teams. We are coming back uh, next month with our fifth episode, How Are We Supposed to Be Using Design Tokens Anyway? Um, which is awesome because we started to talk about design tokens a little bit in this episode. Um, so we're going to do all of the dirty work associated with design tokens next month. In an hour. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to know everything you need to know. Yeah, I, I think, I think yeah, for sure. It's a great topic. Um, and then we would also love to hear if you do reach out to your brand and marketing friends um, and how that goes and where you end up. Um, would love to hear that. So definitely post that in, in our Slack community um, or just reach out to us. I think, I think we, we will, will end the, the podcast portion um, there. Uh, and we'll also say a massive thank you to everyone who joined the webinar portion and contributed questions and contributed answers into how you all uh, maintain uh, connections between marketing and product design and what that looks like uh, for super large companies and everything in between. Yeah, it was great to to hear the questions and the and the feedback that people have. Um, definitely sounds like a, a topic that people are trying to navigate. So um, it was really great. And we hope if you have questions in the future, um, you know, or updates, like let us know. We'd love to love to hear that. And then if you also have topics that you want us to cover in the future, um, feel free to, to let us know as well. We're happy to, um, you know, address some of the, the more pressing topics that people have for sure, um, like tokens. So, all right, amazing. We will see y'all next month on February 13th. Uh, really looking forward to it and have a fantastic rest of your day.